verse 1, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, some from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. In the late 1980s, a uh, newspaper in Iowa featured an article uh, which was a story about Cindy and Sonia. And the story could have easily been on like Dateline or uh, NBC 40, or 48 Hours. I know NBC and Dateline, that's the same thing. Um, <laughs> And these two had grown up together. They had been in high school together. They competed in local beauty pageants together. Sometimes one would win and sometimes the other. Cindy was Miss Harvest Queen and Sonia was Miss Homecoming Queen. Well, the competition really got to its hottest between the two women when they had a romantic uh, interest, a shared romantic interest. A man named Jane, uh, Jim, who was a strapping Gaston kind of guy, you know, everything a woman would want. And the article doesn't tell us about what Jim thought about the two women uh, wanting him, but it does tell how he had to choose one or the other or neither. And Jim did choose. He chose Sonia instead of Cindy. And they announced their plans to get married. Well, to Cindy, when she heard the news, she was devastated. She wasn't a person who had normally lost, you know, rom romantic interest because she was a good-looking gal. And so she felt like Sonia and Jim had done this to her personally, to hurt her. And so she wasn't just disappointed, and she wasn't just sad over not getting Jim, but she was tormented that her longtime rival, Sonia, was happy and... and in love and getting married to her interest, her man Jim. So she was miserable and Sonia was happy. So Cindy turned and married or er, uh, murdered Sonia. One autumn evening, Miss Harvest Queen strangled Miss Homecoming Queen with a leather belt. This story is not really unique to that story in Iowa. It's a story that has been repeated throughout history. It's a story about envy. It's a story that has its roots in the very beginning of human history. You know the story. Two brothers come to grief over an offering. One has an offering before the Lord, and it's accepted. And the other's offering does not please the Lord. And this made Cain extremely angry. Cain took his brother Abel out into the field and murders him in cold blood. So you have a shut, open shut case. First degree murder. What is the motive? Envy. You know, it's kind of weird though. Because why, why is Cain so angry at Abel? Why isn't Cain more angry at God? What did Abel do to Cain in this situation? You, you might think that, you know, why not just shake a fist, angry fist at God? What does Abel have to do with God not accepting Cain's sacrifice? After all, did Abel turn God against Cain? No. Did Abel tell God not to accept Cain's sacrifice? No. So what's the deal, Cain? You got the wrong guy in this situation. Why murder your own brother? It's because of envy. Envy, that's why. One can hardly doubt that Cain was angry at God. I'm sure he was. Hatred towards God, though, is, is hard to satisfy, so he turns it towards his brother. 
And hatred causes him to cease to see Abel as his brother and sees him as a rival. The one who's envious doesn't care about deserving, whether or not Abel will deserve that blessing or not, or whether or not uh, Sonia deserved to have Jim. It didn't matter. Uh, so Cain doesn't care if Abel's offering is more pure and deserves God's admiration. Neither does Cain care about how to gain the same favor with God. Envy is obsessed with not allowing somebody else to have the good that you desire for yourself. And in our culture, we tend to confuse um, envy and covetousness and jealousy. They seem to run together just in contemporary uses of the words. So what covetousness is, uh, when somebody sees something that somebody else wants, you say, I want one too. I want to go on vacation in Jamaica too. <laughs> I want that nice pair of skinny jeans too. <laughs> That's sort of an inside joke for those who are at the Valentine's Day dinner. <laughs> um, you know, this parking lot is full of beautiful SUVs, and I might walk out the door and say, I want one too. But the covetous person doesn't care if they get that person's SUV, that person's vacation, that person's uh, skinny jeans. They care about getting the product. They don't care about who has that product. So a covetous person may be tempted to steal something. Or they may just be simply tempted to take out a large loan in which they can't afford and go to the store and get it. So the, the covetous person is interested in money, a spouse, property, dignity. And we covet something, we can desire to rob that person from it, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. So the covetous person says, I want one too. The difference between the covetous person and the envious person is the envious person says, not I want that too. They say, I want that one, the one that they have, that one there. And I'm actually more concerned that they don't have it than I have it myself. The envious person is interested in, in whether or not a person uh, is <coughs> superior to them. It's about a superiority. It's where you get your identity from. If the person has something more than me, that makes me an inferior person. And that's what the envious person feels and thinks. So they're equally concerned with the other person not having it because it's how it makes them feel. So that's why it's the envier has satisfaction to see a rival's good taking, taken away, even if they can't have it themselves. So that's why it worked for Cindy to kill Sonia. Because if she couldn't have Jim, then neither should her rival have him either. And that made her feel better about herself. That's why Cain kills Abel. If he can't please God, then neither should he be able to please God. That's envy at work. Joseph Epstein once said, of all the deadly sins, envy is no fun at all. Only envy is no fun at all. Because there's something self-destructive about envy. There's something self-hating about envy. The, envy, the envious person uh, resents another person's good gift because it makes them superior to his own. It's not because the other person is better. It's only by comparison that they seem better to you. And that is what makes you feel envious. And it makes you feel inferior to them. So this story, I've already said that history um, has loads of story about envy. Um, this is not just an anecdotal story, the story of Cain and Abel. It's just the first case among many of history's envy victims of the hatred of the, and the rival. And I think one of the most obvious stories in scriptures of envy is between Saul and David. You have uh, Saul, who is this king that's looked up to as the great protector of the people of Israel. Um, but then along comes this little shepherd boy who goes out and slays the giant, the one that Saul himself is afraid to confront. And, and then what do the people begin to sing in the streets, which really gets Saul so angry. <laughs> David. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now to a normal person, um, if I were not an envious person and I was the one, they say Brian slain his thousands, I would be like, yeah, 
I slayed my thousands. <laughs> but to an envious person, that doesn't work because they want to be the best. They want to be the superior one. So the fact that David has slayed his tens of thousands diminishes Saul's, uh, his own sense of self-worth. And so he becomes envious of what they think about David. Again, the envier wants not only what the other person has, but they also want that other person not to have it because it just diminishes their self-worth. So what does Saul do for the rest of his kingly life? It seems like he's chasing David around, just simply trying to kill him because he is the rival. He is the one who, um, if he can be erased, then once again, Saul returns to prominence. Once again, Saul is the one who is the great hero of Israel. Now, uh, the double portion. This is a great analogy to help you completely understand what an envious person thinks. If you offered an, en an envious person something, but then you also said the person next to you gets double that, they will always ask for something negative. So normally you might not say, hey, I'll give you anything, but I'm gonna give your neighbor um, twice as much. You would say, Okay, I'll take a million dollars. Okay, your neighbor gets two million dollars. And so an envious person will never go for that because then immediately their neighbor becomes greater than they. So an envious person, if you said, I'll do the double portion with you, then an envious person will say, okay, take my right eye. And then it'll make the neighbor lose two eyes. And then that makes the envious person greater. That's why they'd always take away than mm -hmm. give. That helps you to understand what an envious person is like. They would rather be greater than they would than their neighbor, no matter what that means. Doesn't mean it. I'd rather be in jail as long as my opponent, my rival, is dead. That's better. Some of you have uh, unwittingly thought that you would like to be envied. <sighs> You would like people to envy your life. You would like people to look at you with this sort of, oh, wow, I wish I could be them. I wish I could have what they have. Um, I, you really don't want that. You really don't want that. And some of you even have crafted your, your social media activity to show only the very best things of your life. Maybe even portray your life as a little bit better than it actually is. And so you have caused maybe even some to scorn you, even some to be covetous of you, but maybe even some to envy you. You do not want that to happen. You don't want people to envy you. Those who envy are malicious and backbiting people. They tear up your reputation if possible. And if not possible, they can even destroy your life because you display daily, and it be it maybe in social media online, their insufficiencies, the way that they view their self is in comparison to you. Sometimes you can have a hard time understanding why your brother has such a problem with you or why your siblings can have such a problem with you. Well, one of the things that might be happening is that they may be envious of you. They may, you may be a living example of all that they thought they could have been but now you are better, and so the parents don't love you the way that they should because of you. Or you can see how envy plays in everyday life with sibling rivalries and different things like that. So the thing about envy is it rarely gets out in the open. Almost always done with passive aggressive stabs in the back, with whispers and murmurings, half-hearted compliments. Hear this from Pierce Plowman. This is, this is a great example of envy. Ready? I have a neighbor near me whom I annoy often, and belie him to Lord to make him lose silver, and make his friends foes through false speaking. His gain and good luck grieve me sorely. Between house and house I sow hatred, so that life and limb are lost through my whispers. When I meet at the market the man whom I envy, I greet him graciously and with friendly manners. And often offend, and fear to offend him, for he's stronger. If I had might and mastery, God knows my wishes. So I live without love, like a low mongrel. All of my body bursts from the bitterness of my anger. Envy just hates open warfare because it comes with a sense of powerlessness. You would never envy somebody who you felt that you were truly better than. So that's why envious is always so subversive. 
And that is also why you don't want somebody to envy you. And this is a point in which we need to be careful that we are not being the enviers. Be careful with your words. Are you tearing somebody down behind their back? Are you talking about them in a negative way to get others to feel negatively towards them too? A lot of times that that is a hint or a symptom of either a covetous behavior or an envious behavior. So we all need a heart check, I think, there. <clears throat> okay, so how does envy relate to self-image? I've talked a little bit about that already, but a person's self-image is so important. Where do you get your sense of self-worth? If you get your self sense of self-worth in being better than somebody else or being good at something, um, then you'll never be happy. I've talked about it before. I've said, you're not what you do. You're not what people say about you. You're not what you drive. All of those things are so important to realize because if you fall into the trap of saying, I'm good when people say I'm good, then you will, lie, you will be setting yourself up for being an envier. Because there's always going to be somebody out there who's better than you, greater than you, achieving more than you. If you're always comparing yourself to others to gain self-worth, then you will never be happy yourself. The only solution to that problem is when you find your self-worth not in the things that you do, but in belonging, body and soul, and life and in death to our Savior Jesus. That is the only solution to that. You have to realize it's not about who you are, it's about whose you are. And that transforms the whole equation. Because then you don't have to go around finding rivals and competing with people over your sense of self-worth. Do you notice that um, it's only with people that you compare yourself on a, a normal level that you would become envious of? So for instance, um, I played basketball in high school, but I would never really envy Michael Jordan because he's on a whole other level than me. It's with my own teammates at my school that I would envy, the one who starts over me in my game. If I'm the sixth man, then I'm going to be envious easily of the person who's a starter. And I may try and undercut him to the coach. I may try and uh, make him look bad or talk badly about him or, or do something like that. It's those whom are close to you which you will behave this way too. It's maybe somebody even in this very church that you perceive to have equal with you but is your rival. Be careful about envy. It's so seductive, and it's so sneaky, and it's so self-loathing. You are not what you do. You're not what people say about you. You are who you are because you belong to God. And that is enough for your self-image and your self-worth. You know what that has opportunity for you? If you find your self-worth in God, it frees you up with what you do. You don't have to do things just because of what other people are going to say about them. You don't only do things because you're good at them, you do them because you love them, and you enjoy them. That frees you up to live a life which God entirely desires you to live, a full life, not living in fear. The, the bottom line is, I think envy sabotages love. See, envy is not just concerned with having something, it's concerned with the other person. And if you envy somebody, it is impossible for you to love that person. And God has called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. The Ten Commandments are essentially two ta tab tables. You have the love of God and the love of neighbor. And if you envy, you cannot love your neighbor. It is impossible. It's opposed to love. Finally, I think that love of neighbor is connected with loving yourself. And you have to have a proper understanding of who you are, your self-identity, in order to love your neighbor in the first place. If you honestly get your sense of self-worth from comparisons, then you cannot even love your neighbor. Because you will only love them as you love yourself. And if that's by comparison, then that won't work. You have to love as somebody who has been freed from this comparison model. Someone who's free to love truly as God has called us to love. It's just deadly to our souls uh, when, when you do the comparison game. It happens so naturally. You go to the park with your, your two-year-old 
and you see them running, and then somebody other other mother will start talking to you about when did your kid start walking? Oh, you know, has your kid done their ABCs yet? You know, this whole comparison game is almost always a, a chance to like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit better. My kid doesn't do the pacifier anymore. My kid is done nursing. My, you know, all of these things, it's just so natural to everyday life in the world where competition is just everywhere. It's so easy to fall into this mode of thinking, am I a good mom or a good dad based upon how my kids perform in comparison to other people's kids? It's so deadly. Don't fall into it. Listen, I'm going to close with this. Christ is the answer, and I've already told you how. But he's also the answer in a different way. Because Christ died for both Cain and Abel in our story. Christ died for both the envier and the one who's a victim of that envious crime. He died for both sinner and saint. He died for us all. And though we all have sin in our lives, be it envy or another, that Christ died for us, no matter what we've done. And we need to accept that gift if we're going to receive forgiveness and find wholeness of life, finding out who we truly are as part of his, part of his people. Amen? Amen.